All good? Wonderful. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I, it's an absolute delight to welcome you all to this event and to Aberdeen, um, for those of you who are not from here, um, and also to welcome Val to Aberdeen. Um, I'm just going to make a few housekeeping announcements before we get into kind of the main event for the evening. Um, so we are going to be um, hearing a little bit from Val's latest novel, and then I'm going to be asking her some questions. After that, though, there will be an opportunity to ask your own questions, um, and that applies both to the in-person audience and to the audience online. If you're part of the in-person audience, you'll notice in front of you, you've got a little screen. Um, and underneath the little screen bit of your screen, I guess, there's a button that says speak. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Um, if you just press that, if you raise your hand to show that you want to talk, and then when you're called upon, if you just press that button, that will mean that your little EU style um, mic will come on and you will be able to hear you asking your question. Um, if you're struggling at all, though, the tech team can help you with that. They will see what you're doing. But just raise your hand, and then there's a wee button. If you're online, if you could pop your question into the Q&A during um, the talk, then we will call upon you um, when we reach the Q&A section of the talk. Um, otherwise, I would just like to thank um, the Word Festival for organising this event with the support of Creative Scotland and the University of Aberdeen. We have Leslie Creerer with us. She will be our BSL interpreter today. Um, those of you online should be able to see her um, and those of you in person should be able to see her too. Um, there's also a closed captioning function for those of you who are watching online and you'll be able to see a wee button to make that happen at the bottom of your screen. So, I think that's everything, um, other than if the fire alarm does go off for any reason, please just calmly leave the auditorium. It will not be a drill. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm just delighted to introduce the award-winning author Val McDermott to Aberdeen. Val is a Scottish author with international name recognition. Her works have been translated into 40 languages, but her perspective remains resolutely Scottish. Val is perhaps best known for her crime writing, um, in particularly The Wire and the Blood books, but she's written across a wide range of genres and media. She's won numerous prizes and awards, including the Theakston's Outstanding Contribution to Crime Fiction Prize. She's also something of a trailblazer. She wrote the, one of the first British crime novels with a lesbian protagonist, and has since continued to forge new paths through her work. So it's fantastic to have you here. Welcome, Val. Thank you. Very gracious introduction there. I'll try to live up to it. <laughs> I know. I did feel I had to write them all down. There were so many things to get through. So I think the first thing we're going to do is Val is going to um, talk a little, well, actually read a small part of her new book, 1979. Yeah, I just want to set the scene a little bit before, uh, before I start the reading, really. Um, this book came about because of COVID-19. Uh, I finished my previous novel, Still Life, in lockdown, the first lockdown. It was March, April uh, 2020, uh, and I didn't know what I was going to write next. Normally, I have a pretty clear idea, as I come towards the end of one book, what the next book's going to be. Um, and the problem I have is that all my books are broadly set against a contemporary world. And I couldn't write against the contemporary world because... It was changing every single day. If you can cast your mind back, uh, back to March 2020, there was no vaccine. The, the death toll was rising on a daily basis. Nobody felt safe. It was a very unsure place to be. And I had no idea what August 2021 was going to be like, so I had no idea what kind of book to write that would sit in August 2021 without appearing either exploitative or ridiculous. And so I thought I have to find a different approach. Uh, and so what I thought is I can go back in time because I know what happened before COVID arrived. And for a while, my, my publisher had been on at me to write a memoir. But frankly, if I was going to write an honest memoir, I'd, I'd have to wait for a lot of people to die first. Um, <laughs> either that or spend the rest of my life in the, the libel courts. Um, and, and also, I, I, to be quite honest, I couldn't be bothered spending that much time in my own head. Uh, and so I thought it would be interesting to take a look at the last 40 years, uh, which is essentially my, my life as a writer, first as a journalist and then as a writer of fiction, though some might not see much of a distinction there. Um, but I thought it, it, it was a time of extreme change. We've lived through huge upheavals in the last 40 odd years uh, in every sphere of our lives, technology, politics, forensic science, music, food, 
everything you can think of, the role of women, the position of, of gay people within society, all sorts of things have changed in that time. And I thought looking at them through the lens of one character over a period of time would be an interesting way to basically plunder my life and plunder the things that I'd seen and experienced over the years. So I thought last year of normal life was 2019. If I do it in 10 year chunks, that takes me back to 1979. And I thought about 1979 and basically I rubbed my hands with glee as it was a fabulous year to write about. It uh, starts with the winter of discontent and the book carries on through the Scottish devolution referendum and then finishes just before the uh, election of Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister, which changed several things about the place. So um, my protagonist is a young journalist called Ali Burns. And I would, I would say uh, quite clearly that Ali Burns is not me. Um, although I was working on the Daily Record at the time this book is set, uh, if, if I was writing the true story of what happened to me in 1979, trust me, it would be very different. I was young, free and single. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, Ali is, is uh, although she's a, she's a journalist, she's, she has different ambitions to the ones I had. She, she is ambitious to be an investigative journalist uh, and to escape the perpetual grind of doing women's stories. So. I'm just going to read you a wee bit from close to the beginning of the book, just to, to set the scene a bit. Ali Burns stared out of the train carriage window at white, broken only by a line of telegraph poles. The train sat motionless, trapped in mid-journey by drifts blocking the tracks. She glanced across at Danny Sullivan. How come winter always brings Scotland to a standstill? He chuckled. It's just like murder on the Orient Express, stuck on a train in a snowdrift. Only without the murder, Ali pointed out. OK, only without the murder. And the luxury and the cocktails and Albert Finney in a hairnet. Danny pulled a face. Picky, picky, picky. Emery would think you were on the subs table fiddling with my commas and misrelated participles. Ali laughed. I don't even know what a misrelated participle is, and I doubt you do. I did once, if that counts. They subsided into silence again. They'd met unintentionally on the freezing platform of Haymarket Station on the second day of the year, colleagues returning to work after spending Hogmanay with their families. There were plenty of her fellow hacks Ali would have hidden behind a platform pillar to avoid, but Danny was probably the least objectionable of them. If he was sexist, racist and sectarian to the core, he'd done a good job of hiding it. And there was no escaping the fact that after time spent with her parents, she was desperate for any conversation from her own world. The nearest she'd come was the first paper of the year, with its coverage of the International Year of the Child, an imminent lorry driver strike, and cut price blouses in Fraser's sale. She'd met up with a couple of school friends for a drink in the village pub, but that had been no better. The chat started awkward and stilted, veered onto the comforting common ground of reminiscence, then backed into a cul-de-sac of gossip about people she didn't remember or had never met. The past few years seemed to have severed her from old acquaintance. As the train had pulled out of Kirkcaldy on the first leg of the journey back to Glasgow, Ali had felt the lightness of reprieve. She'd waved dutifully to her parents, recognising they had nothing to say to each other. When she was growing up, that lack of connection had been masked by the daily routines of work and school, girl guides and bowling club, women's guild and hockey team. Then Ali had gone to university in another country and been parachuted into life on Mars. Everything in Cambridge had been strange. The accents, the food, the expectations, the preoccupations. But she'd quickly assimilated. She believed she'd found her tribe at last. Three years flew by, but then she was unceremoniously cast adrift. And now, after two years in the northeast of England learning a trade, she was back in Scotland. It wasn't what she'd planned. She'd been aiming for Fleet Street in a national daily. But the news editor on her final training scheme post was an old drinking buddy of his opposite number on the Daily Clarion in Glasgow. And it was a national daily, if you counted Scotland as a nation. The strapline on the paper said, One adult and two in Scotland reads the Clarion. The wags in the office added, the other one can he read. <laughs> Strings had been pulled, an offer made. She couldn't refuse. Danny's description of his extended family's Hugmanay celebration was interrupted when the door, at the door at the end of the carriage clattered open and the conductor staggered through, loaded with a pile of blankets. 
As he approached, he distributed them among the handful of other passengers. We're going to be stuck here a while yet, he announced, a gloomy relish in his voice. We've got to wait for the snowplow to get here for Falkirk, and it's making slow progress, I'm told. And the heatings went off. Sorry about that, but at least we've got some blankets. He handed each of them a coarse grey blanket that felt more suitable for a horse than a human. As Ali fussed with hers, she asked Danny what shift he was on next. Day shift tomorrow, you? She pulled a face. I'm supposed to be on the night shift tonight. Unless that bloody snowplow gets a move on, I'm going to be in big trouble. Oh, you've got time. It's barely gone three. And even if you don't make it in on time, you'll not be the only one. Again, the door clattered open. This time, the guard was red-faced and agitated. Are any of you a doctor? He looked around, desperate. Or a nurse? Before anyone could respond from behind him, a woman's scream split the air. I'm going to fucking kill you, you bastard! <laughs> now read on. <laughs> what a brilliant place to cut. Fantastic. So, um, I think what I'm first going to maybe ask you a few questions about is more to do with this book, and then we'll sort of expand out what we're chatting about. So... Um, 1979 is obviously, to some extent, a historical novel. It looks back at recent history in Scotland, and that's very different from still life, which was so very contemporary and really admired in that kind of Brexit moment. Mm -hmm. um, how different was the experience of writing about the past versus writing about contemporary events? Um, how did your process change, and how did the experience change? Well, I had to approach the research in a different sort of way. Um, you know, in, in, when you write about a contemporary novel, you kind of know what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to go and, and, and check the history books to see what happened last week, because you still, well, mostly still remember it. Um, uh, but I, I, I was initially having to rely almost entirely on memory because uh, when I started writing this book, uh, I couldn't get into the libraries to check references. Mm. Um, for, for when I'm writing about recent history, as I've done in several of the books, I've, which have got split time frames, uh, one of my primary sources is newspapers. Because mm. you can go and read the history books uh, and, and, and you can go and read commentary on the time. But that deals with the big stories. Mm. Uh, it deals with international situations, it deals with changes of government. It doesn't necessarily deal with the stories we were all talking about in the canteen or in the bus queue or over the dinner table. For that, you need to go to the newspapers at the time. And you also get all the other stuff there as well. You get what was on the telly, what was on the pictures, what people were wearing, what the furniture looked like, how much a pint was, uh, what was on sale at Tesco's. All of those things are, are there in, in the newspapers. And, uh, of course, when, when you start looking at newspaper archives, it jogs your memory and you go, oh, yeah, I remember that, or, or I remember reading about that or hearing about that. So that avenue was, was kind of closed to me to begin with. I read quite a few novels that had been written in, and published in 78 and 79, again, just to give me a flavour for the time that, that might jog my memory for things that I remembered from actually being there. Um, but mostly I, I, I had to rely on what I, what I remembered until I could actually get into the, the library, which opened up again last summer, uh, briefly, uh, for, you could have one session a week mm. of four hours at a time, which wasn't very much, but I, I rattled through a, a, lot of, a lot of newspapers in that time. And the really weird thing was that uh, I, I was still working at the Daily Record, the, the first part of 79, and every now and again I'd come across my byline, and often on stories I had no recollection of having written, places I had no recollection of ever having been, which was slightly worrying. It made me question how accurate the rest of my memory was of the time. Uh, and uh, ultimately also I was able to uh, do what I like to do best when I'm researching anything, not just history but forensics or, or any other subject, is talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about, who was there at the time in this, in this instance. So I hooked up with, uh, with Ruth Wishart, who was the ones editor on the Daily Record for part of the time I was there. Uh, and, and we had a, as soon as you were allowed to meet somebody else in your own garden, we had a freezing cold afternoon in her garden, uh, talking about, on, about 1979, and, and I was kind of checking my recollections against hers. Uh, and I got some great gossip that I never knew at the time. Um, so, but, so that was kind of how I approached it. Uh, I tried to approach it as I would approach any other novel in, in terms of identifying what I didn't know about or what I wasn't clear enough about and pursuing that. 
No, that's brilliant. That's exactly what I'd wondered, was how yeah. much of our memory is actually accurate when we try yeah. and write about it. Yeah. And the music helped as well. Mm. Um, there's a playlist at the back of the book of some of the, the tracks that I was listening to. Not while I was writing, because I, I can't listen to things with lyrics when I'm writing, but when I was like in the car or when I was like, you know, just pottering about the house or cooking the tea. Um, and, and that music's, music's an amazing time machine, isn't it? I mean, so often, you, you know, you're in a shop and there's a track playing or you, you listen, something comes on the radio and instantly you're back in a, a pub or a club or somebody's living room or your own kitchen or, you know, who were you going out with at the time? What pub did you frequent? What clubs were you going to? And you remember dancing to it or you remember you're having your heart broken to it and it takes you right back and it gives you that, that instant snapshot of a moment and you can think what I was wearing, what I was drinking, what it smelled like and, and all that comes from, from, from music, I find. So that, again, was another, another useful tool for recreating the past. To what extent, kind of going into this kind of memory um, theme, um, what, one of the things I loved about this novel is how carefully rendered that newspaper office is. You know, all of the little details about the way that you would have gathered the news in 1979, all the ways that an office would run. To what extent did you draw on your own experiences of being in a, in a newspaper office? Oh, completely. The, the, more, the more I started writing about it, the, the more stuff came back to me. Um, and, and although those kind of details are, are very definitely a reflection of my own experience, I mean, Ali's say very definitely not me um, but yeah the more I sort of started digging into that I, I remembered things that had happened or anecdotes that I'd heard from other people about things that had happened and that's sort of found their way into it. and I mean I can still very vividly remember what the Daily Record newsroom was like uh, in terms of you know the, the characters the smells the sounds the the, the hierarchies the, the relationships uh, it, it's still very very clear in my head um, so uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because we're talking about developing it for television at the moment already. Um, and uh, so I've been talking to the writer about it and, and, and explaining it to her. She says, oh, this is great because you've got such a visual idea of it. That I can just plunder that when I'm, I'm describing it. Brilliant. Um, one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about in relation to this novel is... Um, in the past, um, you have touched on political themes before, and you've sometimes been critiqued for talking about politics, um, but you continue to do it, which I think is fantastic. And in 1979, you're talking about the, de the revolution, the I'm so sorry. The revolution of <laughs> the 1979. The revolution of 1979, we wish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, um, you're talking about um, the referendum of 1979. Um, again, and you're kind of going back to it, why do you feel it's important to engage with politics in your writing to such an extent? Well, I think if you're writing contemporary fiction of any kind, you can't fail to engage with the world around you, and that means engaging with the politics of the world around you. It always interests me that people only talk about novels being political if they uh, advocate any kind of change to the status quo. Somehow, novels that they say things should remain the same, i.e. essentially conservative, novels are not regarded as being political. To me, it seems to me they are just as political, but in a different way. Um, the devolution referendum was, was a huge thing in Scotland in 1979. I mean, it really was a, a defining moment. Um, and it, it, it energised the whole uh, forward movement of a, a national uh, movement, a movement towards independence, um, because basically we voted for a parliament and didn't get it. And people were really pissed off. Um, that the goalposts had been moved at the last minute. But interestingly, nobody south of the border seemed to notice it was even happening. I read a novel recently that was set in... There's a novel, contemporary novel, published now, set in 1979, with a political background, and the Scottish devolution referendum and the bringing down of Callaghan government by the SNP was not even mentioned. I put that out there. It was an irrelevance. Um, and... For those of us living in Scotland, it wasn't an irrelevance. It was, it was the start of uh, something that's gone on for 40 years, which is a national conversation about the country we want to be. And that conversation would, would never have started without the, the devolution referendum, I think. No, absolutely. I really agree with you. And I think this tendency to think that novels that just reinforce the status quo are therefore not political mm. is really bizarre, actually, and, and a strange feature of literary criticism. Um, 
sort of expanding our scope out a wee bit, um, when you look back over um, your works over the years, all your novels, do you, you have these kind of very strong protagonists to some of your series who've reoccurred? Um, is there any protagonist that you just enjoy putting their shoes back on and experiencing the world through their eyes? Well, whenever I return to a, a particular protagonist, whether it's uh, Tony Hill and Carl Jordan or Karen Pirri or going back earlier, uh, to, to Lindsay Gordon and Kate Brannigan, it was because I was excited about writing a story. It's always a story that drives me. Um, and so um, when, I, when I start to have the germ of an idea of a story and it starts to take shape in my head, very soon I know whose story it is. Uh, and that, that means I can get excited about the story and that means equally that I'm excited about revisiting that character because it's their story mm. and it fits their personality and the kind of job they do and it's only their story. I couldn't squeeze Tony Hill's feet into Karen Piddy's shoes, for example. Um, so when I sit down to... I've, I've been very lucky over the years. I've had editors who've understood that the way to get the best work out of me is to let me write the books that are pa I'm passionate about, the books that are shouting in my head. Um, and so whenever I sit down to start a new book, it's because I'm excited. Uh, so whoever I'm writing about at that time, they are my favourite child. Uh, and and uh, I can't wait to get back to them. The thing that is going to be a real challenge with uh, the Ali Burns quintet, as I'm kind of thinking of it in my head, in a hubristic sort of way, um, is that and s since, I, since I gave up my day job in 91, I haven't written two books with the same characters back to back since those first two Brannigans that I wrote after I stopped working full time. And I got halfway through the second one of those and I thought, I'm really bored with this woman. You know, she's smarter than me, she's thinner than me, she's funnier than me, she's better at computer games than me, what a bitch. You know, um, and, and so I, 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 I kind of need that variety. I'm very easily bored. Uh, I, need, I need to, to keep my, myself engaged. So I'm going to have to write a series of novels with the same character. Uh, and what I'm hoping is that the 10 year gap means that uh, Ali will, ha things will have happened to Ali in those 10 year intervals to, to move her forward. So the Ali Burns of 1989 is not quite the same as, as uh, Ali Burns of 1979. She's learned from her mistakes. She's, she's grown as a person. She's feeling differently about the world that she's working in. She's experiencing a different response to what the world of journalism has become and stuff like that. So I'm hoping that's going to be fine. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be climbing the walls after the third book going, what do I do now? <laughs> Um, Suddenly there is a new series with a new protagonist. Yeah. Well, um, I, 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 I am at some point going to have to squeeze a Karen Piri in there um, because I've got a great idea for a new Karen Piri, but uh, somehow I'm going to have to negotiate that one. Bro, um, the other sort of thing I wanted to ask about the oeuvre in general is you've had quite a bit of your work adapted for the screen over the years. What was that experience like? What is it like to see the world that you've imagined translated onto screen and how much did you get to decide what that looked like? Well, I mean, with the best will in the world, you never really get to decide what it looks like. Mm -hmm. You only get to manage a, a, you manage to squeeze a bit of control, uh, usually along the lines of uh, having a clause in your contract that says they can't make substantive changes to the main returning characters without your consent. Um, and that's not always entirely easy to enforce. Um, but mostly, uh, I, I've worked with people that I, I, I trusted to make good television. And certainly, um, for example, when we, we made the Tony Hill series, I, I sat down at the very beginning with Robson Green and the, the series exec producer, and we talked about the, the, the elements of the book that were, were essential, that were key to making them distinctive and unique. And that those were the elements we had to cling on to. Uh, and we talked, we talked all that out. Uh, and at the end, I said, now your job is to go and make the best television you can. You have to let go, because television is a different beast. It has a different way of telling stories. Uh, and you have to just say, you know, maintain the atmosphere of my books, maintain the integrity of the characters, and then make that work in your world, in your world of storytelling. And so far, I think I've been very well served. I've just seen um, Karen Piri will be coming to the screens in the new year uh, with an uh, adaptation of The Distant Echo. Uh, and I'm happy to say it's going to be a six-hour adaptation so it'll get proper room to breathe. It's not going to try and cram the whole story into 90 minutes. Um, and I think it's going to look stunning, uh, what I've seen so far. I think it's great telly. Um, and people will go, but that's changed and that's changed. But things have to change mm -hmm. in order to make it work dramatically. 
Um, and it was particularly problematic for them because Cavern's role in the distant echo is relatively small. But they had to foreground her much more. So there's been fiddling about with the front end of the story, but it works. It works really well. Um, and we're, uh, we're doing a second series of traces, which I storylined uh, the first series of and was, uh, was, seemed to go down pretty well. So, yeah, I've, I've, I've been fortunate that, that the people I have worked with have, have been good, uh, good makers of television, if you like. I can't write television scripts. My brain doesn't work in that way. I don't see the unfolding of story in, in a sort of panning shot along a line of shops or whatever. It doesn't, it's not how it works for me. I can do radio plays and I can do theatre plays because they're all about the words still. Um, but television defeats me completely. I'm just glad that there are people out there who can do it better than me. Brill, um, you've, as I mentioned in the introduction, been a real pioneer for LGBTQ plus representation. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a wee bit about how the representation of people within that community has changed over the time you've been writing, and also why you think it's important to foreground those types of stories. Well, I think it's important that, um, that fiction, that literature, reflects the world that we live in and doesn't exclude people because they're not in the ruling class, as it were, they're not the, the, the favoured group. And, and publishing is a very white, middle-class world, and it's taken them a long time just to translate fiction from other countries. Um, you know, I mean, several of us in, in, in the crime-writing world banged on for years about what good crime fiction there was in, in European countries, and we should be translating that. And wouldn't, we, wouldn't it be better to have a good Swedish novel than another mediocre English novel? And it takes time to effect change. And, and what generally affects the change is for one book to have a success. So with, you know, with the Scandi Noir, it was, it was the, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, and suddenly everybody had to have their Scandi list. Um, and that's kind of how things change. Uh, it was a bit uh, more gradual uh, in LGBT publishing. Um, I think in the 1980s, there was a, a sort of surge uh, of, of lesbian fiction, particularly lesbian crime fiction, because of the new wave of American crime fiction uh, with female protagonists written by people like Sarah Paretsky, and Sue Grafton, Barbara Wilson, Mary Wings, and some of that was lesbian. Uh, and publishers like the Women's Press and Virago and Pandora were the publishers of, of in, indie publishers of, of women's fiction. And that was the kind of home of those novels. And when I wrote the first Lindsay Gordon novels, I knew they'd never be picked up by a mainstream commercial publisher. And I sent them off to the Women's Press and, and they published them, and that was great. Um, and it, it, but, but the market was small, principally because the, those publishers uh, published paperback originals. And most of you here are far too young to remember this, but in the 1980s uh, and the early 90s, paperbacks didn't get reviewed at all. The book pages only reviewed hardbacks. So my first few novels came out and not a single review uh, when they first came out. And my books, my, my Lindsay Gordon books, have never been out of print since they were first published mostly because of booksellers and readers using word of mouth to say, you should read this book. I've just read this great book, I really enjoyed it. Um, and for me, one of the important things about, about, um, about Lindsay Gordon was that when I was growing up, there, wasn't, there were no templates for a life that wasn't heteronormative. There was no books about a, a people who happened to be gay. There was no gays on the soaps, there was no gays in movies apart from the odd porno. You know, and so it was really hard to get any sense of what your sexuality might mean and, and what, what was that sexuality even. Um, so I, one of the reasons I, I wrote Lindsay Gordon the way I did, I mean, I, I, and I didn't sit there d determined to write, you know, the sort of great lesbian pioneering novel. She just, I mean, that was the way that the character emerged. That was, that was who she was. Um, but I, I wanted, I didn't want to write a coming out novel full of angst and, and, and complicated emotional relationships. I wanted to write a novel where you had a character who happened to be gay. It was part of what made her who she was, but it wasn't the only thing about her. It wasn't always the most important thing about her. I wanted to write about the kind of life that I led, because you know, not all my friends are gay, not all my friends are lesbians, not they're all queer. Um, I don't go shopping in a particularly lesbian way. I don't, you know, I don't go around waiters going, is there anything lesbian in here tonight? You know, it, it, it's, it, my life is, is, is essentially quite normal and quite like other people's, apart from the person I choose to love. Um, and so that was the kind of book I wanted to write, and I wanted there to be something for the next generation of women coming up after me. 
because there had been nothing. It was a desert. And now, of course, it's not. I mean, now it's, it's, a, it's an increasingly populated field. But it needs, it, what it needs for that to happen is for people to have some success and then other people come in behind them. It's, it, you can see it with any kind of literary movement. So one of the things that has really um, um, pushed the, the embracing of, of black fiction, for example, is writers like Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie and, and Bernie Nevaristo. Bernie winning the, the Booker Prize was a huge step forward, I, I mean, because it pushed, uh, put her book front and centre in all the bookshops, it was talked about, she was interviewed, she was on the TV, and people who might otherwise not have read her book picked it up, because it was this year's Booker Prize winner, and some people just buy the Booker shortlist every year. So it's those small things that start a movement. Um, for, for example, in, in, in Scotland, we had no history of, of crime fiction. We had no real um, tradition. We didn't have, we didn't have the, the tradition, which is also a bit of a millstone of Agatha Christie and the Queens of Crime of the, the Golden Age. But we didn't have anything else really to put in its place. I mean, we had J James Hogg's Confessions of a Justified Sinner. We had Jekyll and Hyde. We had Sherlock Holmes to an extent. But there wasn't anything that was contemporary or modern until William McIlvanny wrote Laidlaw. And coincidentally, round about the same time that we were talking about the devolution referendum, here was a novel set in working class Scotland that spoke the language of the streets. It's, it, the dialogue, you, when I, remember, I remember reading that book, it was, I was shocked. I'd never read a book like this. I'd never read a book that actually had working class Scottish life on the page and not in some quaint way of, oh, look at the, look at the working people. Mm. Just in a sort of an absolutely heartfelt, this is how we live. Um, and that pushed the door open a crack. People, people bought Laidlaw, people liked Laidlaw. Uh, and then you know, it took 10 years for, for me and Ian Rankin to sort of get our, our first foot across the threshold. But once we'd pushed the door open a bit further, you know, we got trampled underfoot, which is great. And now Scottish crime fiction is, is one of the most lively and, and exciting and expansive uh, areas of, of genre anywhere in the world. No, absolutely. And I think one of the wonderful things about crime writing from Laidlaw onwards as well is the way that life happens around the crime and it kind of yeah. in strange ways shows parts of society that maybe don't get to be in literary pages. And I love that about your novels as well, that I learned what people were eating and, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, I, 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 think, I, think, I think it's... it's um so I had something I was going to say that it's gone completely out of my head. Never mind. Onward, onwards. 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 Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, um, it's recently announced that you're going to be rewriting Miss Marple. Um, oh, not, well, not quite rewriting. Writing. I'm, I'm, I'm writing a Miss Marple story. Ah. <laughs> so I'm not suddenly going to update her to the 21st century. No, no. But you're sort of returning to yeah. the, the imaginative legacy of Miss Marple and going there. What made you want to take on that project, and how is that going? How has that been so far? Well, I was I was asked by the Agatha Christie estate who mm. were bringing out an anthology next year of, of contemporary women's writers writing Miss Marple stories, uh, you know, kind of extending the, the canon, if you like. Uh, and I was absolutely thrilled and delighted because Miss Marple was my gateway drug into crime fiction. Um, when I was a kid, I used to stay a lot with my grandparents. And they only had two books in the house. One of them was the Bible. And if you've ever sat down and read the Bible, it takes a long time to get to the interesting bits. There's a lot of begats in there. Um, and so I, I, I used to reread The Murder at the Vicarage on a regular basis because it was the only other book in the house. And invariably, I'd run out of the library books that I'd brought with me. So um, Miss Marple was, was... And I've always loved Miss Marple as a character. I've always thought she was a great character. Um, and... Much more interesting than Poirot, I think, um, with his fussy little ways. I mean, uh, you know, I am not a tidy person. I would kill Hercule Poirot in a week of living with him. Uh, but Miss Marple, I feel, would, would give me a bit more leeway. I mean, she you know, should have a maid anyway that would tidy up after me. Um, but I love the thing, one of the things I love about, about the murder at the vicarage, and it's one of the things that I think is often missed when people talk about Agatha Christie, is her sense of humour. Mm. And that's most evident in the Miss Marple novels. There's a lot of sly wee digs along the way, a lot of things that are, are, are you know, sort of clever little asides almost. Uh, and when you're reading them, if you're quickly following it for the mystery, you sometimes miss them. When you go back and you're reading it for the 12th billionth time, you notice them. I mean, there's a wonderful bit at the beginning of the, the, the murder at the vicarage where um, we're introduced for the first time to the spinsters of St. Mary Mead. Um, and... Uh, uh, it's the vicar who's introducing them in, in, in the narrative, and, and he just says, and then there was Miss Hartnell, who was much feared by the poor. 
and you instantly know exactly the kind of woman Miss Hartnell was. And it's, it's, it's funny. It's, it, and uh, as I say, she's, she's not always credited for, for the, the, the humour that she brings to what she writes, but, but it's very definitely in there. And I think the Marple stories are the ones where we see it most clearly. So it will be a challenge. Uh, I mean, what, what I think I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to write a short story called The Second Murder at the Vicarage. So I've got to, I've got to ventriloquise, not just Agatha Christie, but, uh, but, the, but Leonard Clement, the vicar of St Mary Mead, which is going to be fun. That sounds amazing. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you about um, was, besides Miss Marple, what some of the early inspirations for your own writing were? What were some of the books that you've um, loved and drawn upon as you've begun your own writing career? Well, I think, I mean, there are, there are, there are books that you, you carry with you from childhood forward. I mean, I think, um, and for, for me, one of those books, one of those key books that sort of developed me as a, as, as a writer in the initial stages was uh, Stevenson's Treasure Island. Um, I first encountered Treasure Island as a, a classic comic, it was called, which we'd now refer to as a graphic novel, you know, but it was, um, I, I, I came across it entirely by, by chance. My, my great uncle used to buy lots of comics for his grandsons in the hope this would encourage them to read. Didn't encourage them to read, but I inherited an awful lot of comics as a result. And one of them was this, this story of Treasure Island, and I just, I was captivated by it. The, the characters, the adventure, and then I went away and read the book, and that, that, I just, that just blew me away, because the, the descriptions, the, the images that are conjured up, the, I say the characters, I mean, everybody knows who Long John Silver is, he's an, an archetype. Everybody knows about Jim Hawkins, and Ben Gunn and the Cheese, and all those wonderful things. And I go back and, 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 and reread Treasure Island fairly regular intervals, and um, I, uh, I, I, that, that also led me to, to uh, reading Stevenson more widely. And one of the things that, uh, that intrigued me right away about Stevenson was the range of his work. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got the great adventures of, of, of Treasure Island and Kidnapped, and then you've got the darkness of Jekyll and Hyde and, and the Master of Ballantrae and Weed of Hermiston. And then you've got the short stories, which are fantastic. And, and children's verse and, and, and travels in the Cévennes with a donkey. I mean, this, this, the, the, he, he, he was clearly somebody who feared being bored and did not want to risk boredom. And his writing encompasses this great, great field of, of work. And so for me, he was, he was kind of somebody to look up to as a, as a, as a model, really. Uh, but there were lots of other writers, that, lots of other books that, that uh, inspired me and moved me forward in, in what I was interested in, in reading about and, and doing. I mean, I, I hugely uh, embraced the crime novel. It was, it was all, I always had a crime novel on the go. Um, and when I was at Oxford, there was a, a, a bookshop around the corner from my college uh, called Jeremy's 10p Bookshop. And Jeremy had a huge stock, an awful lot of crime novels, and it had this great feature of if you didn't like a book and you took it back, you got 5p back on it, you know, which was, <laughs> was great. So that was, that was the start of me building my, my own library of crime fiction. And that was where I discovered Josephine Tay, mm. who I think is, is one of, was, for a long time, was one of the underrated stars of, of British crime fiction. And indeed, you know, she wouldn't necessarily have described herself thus, but certainly of Scottish crime fiction. Um, and so Tay was in there as somebody that was important to me. But as I, as I carried on reading forward, um, Ruth Rendell was somebody that I, I learned a lot from, and Patricia Highsmith. Um, though I think Highsmith has only really come into her own now that we can see she fits out her own moral landscape much better than she did in the 1950s. But again, with Rendell, what I liked was the, the variety and the scope of her work. Um, and Reginald Hill is another favourite of mine. Um, I love the D. Alan Pascoe novels. It's a great, great narrative. But, but there's also a, a real um, emotional intensity in those books as well that I like. Um, and then moving forward, the, the, the book that really kicked me out of my I want to write a crime novel into actually doing it was, was Sarah Paretsky's first novel, Indemnity Only. And that, for me, was, was a really transformative moment. It was the first time I'd read a, a, a modern crime novel with a female protagonist who had a brain and a sense of humour and agency. She did things herself. She didn't have to get the guys in when things got difficult. Uh, and the other thing about those books that, that really struck me very forcefully was that they were, they were embedded in the area that they were written about. Those, 
that book happened in Chicago because it could only have happened in Chicago because of the kind of, uh, the kind of lives people led, the kind of businesses they led, the way that the society was structured. These were books with personal politics, but also a wider sense of politics. It wasn't just some random murder bolted onto some random village in the south of England. Uh, and, and I thought, this is, this is fantastic. This is a book that's actually very much a social novel of the here and now. Uh, and it's got a woman at the heart of it, and I want to write books like that. And that was what really got me going and actually doing it instead of saying to everybody, I'm going to write a crime novel, and everybody's going, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. <laughs> I know that feeling. Um, we might now go to the question and answer session and allow you guys to come in and, and um, ask some questions. So just to remind you, if you do want to ask a question, raise your hand, and then when um, I call upon you, there's a wee button on your desk that will allow you to speak. Did anyone have a question they'd like to ask? Don't be shy or we'll just start picking on you at random. Yes. Okay, I hope this works. Um, I'm sure you probably get this question a lot of times, but what tips would you give someone who's trying to go into writing crime fiction? Be patient and be persistent. Um, I, I think a lot of people start writing a, a novel and they, they get very bogged down because they, they can't get the first chapter perfect. Uh, I would say just ignore your first chapter, get on with it. You'll not get the first chapter perfect, no matter how many times you rewrite it. And by the time you get to the end, you'll want it to be different anyway. So um, don't, uh, don't use the it's not quite right yet as an excuse just to keep going over the same old ground. And one of the things that um, was very useful to me, although at the time I didn't recognise it as such, uh, was I, I, was, I, I was working full time when I started writing um, the first of the... Well, Lindsay Gordons. Uh, I worked on a Sunday newspaper. I was the Northern Bureau Chief of a national newspaper. I didn't have a lot of free time, but I had Monday. Monday was my day off, and most of my friends were at work on a Monday, so there was very little temptation to go off and do things with them. And I, I put aside a block of time, Monday afternoons from 2 o'clock to 7 o'clock, and that was my writing time. And it was sacrosanct. I didn't answer the phone, I didn't answer the door, I didn't go off and, and do nice things, even if it was a nice day. Um, and and that was what, and that turned into a really productive use of time because for the rest of the week, I'd be rehearsing what I was going to write next. I'd be thinking about, uh, I'd, be, I'd be running through the dialogue of a scene. I'd be, I'd be figuring out how to get from where I'd left the last bit to where I was going to go with the next bit uh, and also the changes I was going to have to make to what I'd done the week before or further back to make it work going forward. So when I sat down on Monday afternoons for my five hours, I had a really clear idea of what I was doing with the time, and it was very productive. And that helped me greatly. I, I wrote my first four novels on Monday afternoons. They each took me about two years. Um, but it, the pages bound up, uh, and, and as I say, it's just that it's about, it's, about, it's about committing to yourself. If you don't commit to yourself, it's hard to get anybody else to commit to you. And it doesn't matter if it's a five-hour chunk on a Monday afternoon or if it's two hours on a Tuesday morning, whatever. I think it's important to set aside some time, even if it's half an hour every night after the kids have gone to bed. Or I, I, know, I know people, I could not do this, this would kill me because I, I, I don't do mornings. But I have friends who, who've sort of started off in the early days of their writing, you know, getting up at five o'clock before the kids get up, doing two hours before anybody wakes up. Um, if you want it badly enough, you'll find, you'll find a way to carve out the time. But be rigid with yourself and don't let yourself be distracted away from it. If it matters enough to you, you'll do it. And be patient with yourself. Thank you. Um, I've got an online question here, which is from New York City. Um, wow. From Eden and Nate, and they're asking, for a new reader of your work, which book would you recommend first? Depends how dark you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want the sort of really dark, twisted noir, then you'd go to The Mermaid Singing, the start of the Tony Hill and Carol Jordan series. Um, always, if you're gonna read any of the series novels, I'd say start with the first one in the series. Um, so that would be The Distant Echo for Karen Pirrie, if you want something that's set in Scotland, uh, in, uh, that's set mostly in Fife, a lot of it in St Andrews. Um, I've, I've written standalones as well, if you, if you want to, to not commit to a series, uh, a place of execution, is often referred to by people as uh, their, their favourite. Um, and of course, you could do worse than starting with 1979, <laughs> which is the start of a series. But I would, I would say, um, you know, it's, it's that terrible thing of, you know, I, I, I like to think I've got better. 
over the years that, that I have improved with time. So I would say to someone, honestly, truly, if you plan to make a dedicated attempt on my work, don't start with the last one. Go back a bit further, because I get better, you know. <laughs> Brill, did anyone in the audience want to ask another question? Sure. Uh, how much do you, do you plan ahead? Do you know how it's going to end when you start, or does it develop organically as you go? Well, I've, I, I have... Um, I have to confess that my, my own practice has changed quite drastically over the years. Uh, early on, I, I was very much a, a planner, a careful planner, because I, I worried that plotting was my weakest point when I started writing. Uh, and so I spent quite a lot of time thinking about story, and, and I, I used to use file cards. I would, I would have a file card for each scene and each chapter and start at the beginning and work my way through. Now, I've heard some people say that they find that a straitjacket way of doing it, and, and they lose interest because they know what's happening next. For me, it felt like a, a security blanket. In a way, it was like having a roadmap, and I, I was following my roadmap. And that didn't mean that I couldn't go and take a detour if I thought of a, a better way of doing something or a more interesting way of achieving something. Uh, it was like I could go off on the detour because I knew where I was coming back to on the story spine. So that worked for me for a long time uh, and then it suddenly, it just stopped working. I was halfway through, I was planning a book out and I got halfway through the plotting phase and I just couldn't break the rest of it down into bite-sized chunks. I knew the ending that I was aiming for but it, it was just completely elusive. I couldn't, couldn't find my way there. Um, and I ended up, I thought, well, I'll, I'll write as far as I've planned out and then I'll know what comes next. So I wrote as much as, as, I, as I could and then I didn't know what happened next. And I was kind of struggling. Um, and I, I thought, is, is this it? I think this is about, oh, I don't know, about 13 or 14 books in. But maybe this is the end of the road. Maybe, I mean, some, some writers have a finite number of books in them. Maybe this is it. Um, and and my, every now and again, my editor would phone me up and she'd say, how are you doing? How's it going? And I'd say, I'm writing! In that sort of <laughs> panic way. <laughs> And in the end, it got to a couple of weeks before for delivery date, uh, and, and you know I've got that terrible Scottish Presbyterian thing of you know I've taken the money, I have to give them a book. Um, you know I can't call myself a writer if I'm not writing. Uh, and I, I went off to to Italy to a place I'd, I'd stayed before that uh, I knew was really peaceful. There was no distractions, no internet, no telephone, no television, no radio. And I just forced myself. I sat down at the laptop every morning, nine o'clock, wrote till half past seven in the evening, had a shower ate one of Mama Rosa's home-cooked dinners, drank a bottle of wine, went to bed, got up in the morning and did it all over again. And I do not know to this day how I did it, but I wrote 65,000 words in nine, ten days and finished the book. Uh, and the, the last day, I'd, I'd thought at the beginning I'd have a nice, if I, if I finished it, I'd have a lovely day in Siena, drinking coffee and eating ice cream and looking out across the square and things. And last day, no, I sat by the pool like this. <laughs> couldn't speak in sentences. And I sent it off to my editor, and, and I, I had no idea if, if this was a book or not. And she came back to me with, um, it's the best first draft you've ever handed in. And I'm thinking, oh no, is this how it's going to be from now on? Um, but I mean, what, what, what actually has, has happened is that I've kind of developed a, a much looser form of, of, put, of, of storytelling now. So when I start with a book, I've got a pretty good idea of the arc of the story. I know roughly where it starts and where it finishes and, and, and how broadly speaking, it's going to get there. I know the world of the book. And I usually know two or three crucial turning points, so it's moments that where, where things really hinge on. Um, and I just start writing it now. And I think it's... Um, I, I don't know if it's just practice that I feel more confident now in what I'm doing or, or what, but, but it did change for me. So, I mean, the lesson that taught me is that this is a dynamic process. There is no rule for how you write a book. It's something that, that works for you. And I, I think the, the best description of how I do it now is, is, is what I heard the American writer E.L. Doctorow calling it driving at night writing. You know, you leave the house and you know where you're aiming for. Um, but all you can see is the bit of road in front of your headlights and you just kind of fare forward, trusting that you'll end up where you want to be or, or as near as damn it. And that's kind of how it is. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, it, it seems to work, um, but you know, I'm, and I'm not, uh, I'm not stupid enough to think that this is necessarily always going to be the way it works for me, and that something different may come along and hit me on the back of the neck when I'm not expecting it. 
You're making me think I need a Mama Rosa to <laughs> sort me everybody out. Everybody needs a Mama yeah. Rosa, trust me. <laughs> so we've got a question here um, online. Sorry, I'm stooping over. Um, how has, Henry is asking, how has the accuracy of your novels to how forensic investigations are done or how crimes are carried out developed throughout your career? Are there any new crimes which have only emerged in the past few years which you've incorporated into your novels? Well, um, I, I think I've, it'd be fair to say that my, my career has gone in lockstep with modern forensics because the first case, a first case where, uh, uh, where DNA was, was crucial evidence in the murder case was 1986, the Colin Pitchfork's case, which has been in the news again recently because he's, he's been released on parole. Um, and that, that was, I say, 86, and my first novel came out in 87. And I was lucky that very early on in my career, I, I made the acquaintance of Sue Black, whom I imagine many of you are familiar with, since she's practically a local lassie. Um, and uh, Sue was, at the time Sue was in Glasgow, working in Glasgow, uh, and I was, um, I was working in Manchester. And we were both on a radio program together. And quite often when you're on a radio program together, you're kind of put in a, a virtual green room uh, where you could talk to each other before you go on air. And we were chatting away, and, and Sue said, if ever you need any forensic help, just give me a ring. She's regretted that ever since. <laughs> <laughs> and within a matter of months, I, I rang her up to, say, to ask her a question. Um, and we got on really, really well, and we've become very good friends over the years. And over the years, she's introduced me to, to many other forensic scientists when I've needed particular help with things. And one of the great things about, about the forensic scientists I've, I've encountered is that they're, they're, they're very good communicators. They love what they do. They're excited by what they do. And they want to share what they do. They want to talk to you about what they do. And it's great because, you know, I go along with, with one or two questions about something specific. And in the course of the afternoon or the, or the, 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 the lunch or whatever we're doing, they'll tell me all sorts of stuff that's tangential to what we're started talking about and I'm thinking oh, I can use that I can use that I can use that mm, I'll, I'll tuck that one away and, and you know on occasions I've, I've got the whole of uh, the whole major plot of a novel in the course of lunch um, and I mean mind you sometimes it gets me into trouble there was one, one time when Sue and I were talking and, and she was she was telling me this thing about the, the bit of research that that, had, that she'd come uh, she'd been doing uh, and it's uh, we're, we're all familiar with the idea that over time our bodies renew themselves that our cells change, and over about seven years, really, most of the cells in the body have, have completely renewed themselves. But um, Sue said, there's one tiny bone in the ear. It's so small that the original anatomist didn't even know to count it. Um, and that bone stays the same from the womb to the tomb. And if you analyse that bone, it will tell you where your mother was living when she was pregnant with you. Now, that's a wow, isn't it? I mean, you don't even have to make up stuff like that. That's just a wow moment. So I put that in the next book, just dropped it in in passing. And I get this phone call from Sue saying, you might as well, you, should, you really should have waited till I'd published the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, should you tell people, you shouldn't tell writers things if you don't want them to end up in a book, you know? <laughs> uh, so yeah, forensics has been really important to me. And uh, it has, it has uh, been a challenge, I think, uh, to how we write about crime because the, the ways that the, the crime investigation has had to change because of um, forensics. I think one of the key things that has been very difficult is, is uh, to have credible amateur detectives. I think that the idea of a Miss Marple or a Hercule Poirot in the 21st century doesn't really hold water because so much rely, there's so much reliance now on the scientific method and the progress of, of forensic science. And it's one of the things I want to look at over, um, over the course of these novels, and probably the, the area of, of crime that has uh, been sort of, as it were, newly developed has been forensic uh, computing crime, mm. uh, the stuff that happens online, the scams that are worked online, and the things that have become possible because of our online personas. Yeah, absolutely, that's such a fantastic answer. Um, I'm aware that we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I think we could all ask questions for hours, but. Um, we will have to sort of wrap up. So I want to first of all thank Val so much for her generous participation in this session. It really has been wonderful. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Word Festival for their hard work on this session and for making this possible, and Creative Scotland and the University of Aberdeen who've supported this event. I'd also like to thank the tech team for their hard work keeping this all running, and Leslie Crerer, who's been a star back there, signing away furiously. It's been brilliant. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.